warm day. Um, and you're here to uh, listen to our president um, talking about the book that he transcribed, um, the Detroit Ordinance District. Uh, this is the last of our uh, lectures um, until the fall. Um, so I hope to see you back uh, then. And we do have a, a variety of different events that are happening this summer, so those will be on the table. And so I hope that you enjoy the lecture today. Mr. Chris Cosmo. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. I recognize a lot of you out here. A lot of our regulars. Glad to see you back again. But, uh, so we're here to talk a little bit about the uh, Detroit Ordinance District in the First World War. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to see the presentation I had been touring on the, called Prelude to the Arsenal. Uh, this, is a, this is a new presentation, so we're not recycling today. Uh, in fact, I just finished this uh, this morning. So hopefully if you see type, if you see type, wasn't it? Uh, forgive me. Uh, this, I mean, this week marks the 100th anniversary of the United States entry into the First World War. Uh, Wednesday or Thursday, I mean, uh, April 6th was the uh, centennial of our of the uh, United States declaring war. So that is why we're kind of looking at World War One. We have these special exhibit in the back room that opened uh, yesterday. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, please uh, take a look at it after the uh, presentation is over. Uh, looking at some of the items from the museum's collection that focus on on uh, Michigan in particular and its role in the First World War. So we've already, we've already, established, we've already established who I am and what we're talking about. So, so what is the Ordinance Corps? We're going to, actually at this point it was called the Ordinance District, or Ordinance Department, I'm sorry. The Ordinance Department does date back to the Revolutionary War um, in, in various forms, obviously. Any military has to procure weapons and ammunition and armament. Uh, there, it was an official act for the War of 1812 that created the Ordnance Department uh, after the war was over, it kind of was diminished, but never fully went away. And then it became a more or less permanent in 1832. So what is the function of the Ordnance Department? Well, to buy stuff, basically. But this is the official, this is the official language out of the out of the Congressional Act. And uh, so it fundamentally buys the guns and weapons and things the military uses in in the amounts and timing described by the general staff. <coughs> <laughs> but um, when the war started, because there's, yeah, there's two different versions of this presentation. <laughs> there was another one that in the officer's guide for 1917, yeah, the ordinance department spe it specifically spelled out knives, forks, and spoons, which I thought was kind of interesting. But apparently, yeah. that slide did not save. So, uh, in April, so once again, 100 years ago, the war starts, April 6, 1917. <laughs> The Ordnance Department consisted of five divisions in Washington, D.C. There was the Gun Division, the Carriage Division, uh, Small Arms and Equipment, Property and Finance, and the Mail and Record. So you can see that our last two, you know, bureaucracy was already strong 100 years ago. We had two departments, you know, nickel clickers and the record keepers. <coughs> so an important thing to remember at this point in time is that the, uh, there was no real centralized buying arm, kind of like what we see now with uh, AMC and the Air Material Command or things like that. It was sort of a free-for-all. The uh, quartermaster, medical engineer, ordinance, they all kind of just bought stuff, went out and they were buying, and they, and actually when World War I started, they were really kind of competing with each other you know, for the limited, uh, the limited, uh, industrial base that was out there, man, manpower shortages, raw materials. Uh, so they were, it was really kind of a mess. And it was very confusing for, for, the, for the industry, for the private sector. 
because we had all these government entities coming out and trying to buy things, and so in some cases, over buying the same things. But from, you know, each one had a different way of doing contracting. And then at this point in time, there was the Army, the Department of the Army, the Department of the Navy. Uh, the Department of the Navy, just by its nature, the fact that the Navy actually did travel overseas just by its mission, but they had a far more robust procurement arm, and they had a lot of contracts in place, so the, the part of the Army found itself, in many cases, competing against these the Navy buyers. So we're gonna look now, we're gonna go very, kind of dive down deep in, in particular into the Ordnance Department as it pertains to the Detroit area. And of course, uh, this presentation is based, as Wendy mentioned, uh, almost entirely off of this particular document. Uh, this document was generated in 1920 and it's official government history of the Ordnance Districts. Uh, there were 13 Ordnance Districts that were stood up and this is the Detroit, the specific history. It will be available for purchase at the end of the lecture. <laughs> so the problem, and this quote comes from the uh, chief of ordinance. The problem is, is that we have 200,000 separate components coming from 5,000 different plants, and you have to somehow coordinate the purchase of all of these things. We need to have people who actually know. So to kind of give you an idea of the scope of what was happening, and just really how rapidly the ramp up was and what the real problem was that these people were encountering at this point in time. And in April 1917, when the United States entered the war, the Oregon's finance section drew 110 checks for just short of a million bucks. In January, and I don't say that same department, there's a little bit of a ramp up here. Oh, yeah. And then in March, and this really, in March is the key because the March of 1918. So, so 11 months into the war, the Ordnance Department and the government really realized we have to, we, the way we're doing business is not working. We have to do something different. So by March, <coughs> and you're seeing, I mean, this is just, they, there's no way they can handle it. So they're like, obviously, a single office in Washington, D.C. cannot handle the magnitude of the job at hand. So what do we do? So in January 1918, they start thinking about, you know, how do we fix this? What do we do? And <coughs> March 26, 1918, they come up with a, with a plan to create the districts, the separate developments districts. And then they all then they realize that the districts need, need to have somebody in charge of them. So then they amend that. With, uh, a couple months later, they're like, oh yeah, we should appoint people to actually head these districts. So that's where they come up. So then the districts, so these are the district offices as they were created. Uh, Boston, Bridgeport, Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Detroit, New York, Philadelphia. Pittsburgh and Rochester. And these are the people that were selected to head them. There were two additional points. There were two additional offices that were stood up after the armistice, because one of the problems that we encountered when the war ended is we realized that it's harder to actually stand to stand down industry than it is to stand up industry. And they created two additional offices for the specific task of closing out contracts. And one was, one was done, set up in Baltimore, and the other one was set up uh, to handle some overseas Canadian contracts that were hit and butt. Uh, so the Detroit District was headed up by Fred G. Robinson. Anybody know who Fred G. Or Fred J. Robinson? Anybody here know who Fred J. Robinson was? He was the president of the uh, Robinson Lowry Co Lumber Company, which was a large lumber company in Detroit. Uh, apparently, they also had a fairly large branch in the center line, or what is now center line. So, it was a fairly well known area businessman. 
Uh, he would head the district and he would uh, receive the Army Distinguished Service Medal for the work that he did. Uh, there's the official uh, general orders giving him the service medal. So it kind of gives you a little, little over what we're going to be talking about, but you can see that, that he was responsible for a fair amount of, of contracting dollars. And you think this is 1917, 1918 money. This is, that's a lot of money. Uh, yeah, like several. <laughs> So where was, where was this Detroit Ordnance District at? Well, the, the, ordinance comp, or the Ordnance Department had already begun establishing some offices in the city of Detroit. Uh, they put, they uh, leased an office on Woodward in January of 1918. And, uh, and then they opened up another office, uh, production division, on the corner of Warren and Woodward. But then when they decided to, set, to decentralize and create the district, they realized they just need, they needed more room. So they, uh, they ended up moving into the book building and consolidating uh, 30,000 square feet. They took up most of the upper half of the book building, a uh, dollar a foot. Wish you could get at least stuff for a dollar a foot today. Yeah. <laughs> <That'd be> awesome. <laughs> But uh, this, unfortunately, this is the book Tower. I was not able to find a good picture of the book building. Uh, the book building itself is this part here. The book Tower was actually added in, uh, in the 20s. Uh, there was supposed to be another tower on the other side, the matching one, but then the Great Depression came, and as, a, as we said, with a lot of construction in Detroit, they just sort of capped it and called it a day. But uh, so most of this floor, this floor, and part of this floor, so that, that was the take on of its day, if you really think about it. That was kind of the origin from the Street. Is where they kind of we started out. Long before Beer Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> there we go. Uh, I threw this in because it's kind of fun. Uh, this is actually from the 50s. This is, a, this is actually a Detroit Ordinance District map. Uh, from the 19th, it's undated, but from the other things in the brochure, uh, it's this is from the Tehom History Office. Uh, and, uh, from the other things in the brochure, it's it's got to be from the 50s. Uh, well, I think it's kind of interesting is you can still see there's a large ordinance presence here, which is a right about where the Rensen is now, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, you can see it's called DOD Packard. Okay, and then there's some other things, but I think over here, Detroit Arsenal going up Gratiot Avenue. So Detroit Arsenal is already open at this point. But it kind of gives you an idea that you know, the Detroit Ordnance District's Detroit roots cover a number of, of decades. So the, the, the district was 59,000 square miles. And you also have, this is also one of the key things here is the population influx. Uh, World War I saw a lot of the same things we would see in World War II, but it, it happened a lot faster over a shorter period of time. Uh, but you had this, this massive worker migration. You know, the, the poor southern sharecroppers were coming up to the north looking for those lucrative industrial jobs where they could make good money. So not only did you have a lot of, of square miles, but you were having this growing growing population. I also saw the large influx of women into the workplace in the First World War. Uh, they don't get the press that Rosie the Riveter gets, but it was definitely, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So this is the actual map of the districts. Uh, it kind of gives you an idea of where the industry base was at the, in 100 years ago. And you can see these, the districts along the East Coast are small, nice little compact districts. Uh, Detroit, you know, the Detroit district is, is big, but still, but then you have St. Louis. There was obviously not a lot of industry that they had to deal with. Uh, this, this system remained in place through the Second World War. Uh, one of the things I found interesting is in the Second World War, the Upper Peninsula gets stripped off the Detroit district and gets transferred to the under the purvey of the Chicago district. And the Detroit district basically is just the lower peninsula for World War II. But in World War I, they have upper and lower peninsula are both controlled by the Detroit district. 
Although if you look through the, the production listing, almost nothing is produced in the Upper Peninsula. There's, there's really very little going on. Chris, so contracts. Question. What about the mining? Yeah. Yeah, but you have to, the common lines are definitely producing. But you have to remember, what we're looking at right now specifically is the ordinance district. So this is, so raw material production and things like that really would have fallen under different, under different uh, uh, oversight. Okay. So, some numbers. So 229 prime contractors, 912 contracts. So, I mean, that's a, once again, a lot of money changing hands of the members of the number one Workforce, there we go. Yeah, so, this, I like this one too. So, these are actual employees for the Ordinance District. So, June 1, 1918, when this, when this district concept was really finally <coughs> stood up, the Detroit Ordinance District has 841 employees. So, October 1, 2,283. No, November 1, so the end of the, we're starting to see the end of the war coming in, so they start letting people go. And then uh, on November 18th, after the armistice, they start just telling people, you know, sorry, we don't need any more wars over. And then December, 75 list, or 75 up, that's a word, right? Well, 75 <laughs> officers and 35 listening. I told you this. I preferred this thing a couple of times. I missed a few things. Yeah, you need to de delete the first one. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so, now we're going to get into the, the, the more of the, the meat and potatoes part of this. And what did the cities of the, what did the cities that fell under the control of the, of the Ordnance District make? So, we made a lot of stuff for the First World War. And another one of the things <coughs> I, I, if you saw some of the previous lectures, uh, one of the things I love to point out and I have to bear in mind is that the United States was only in World War I for 18 months. So a lot of the stuff that we made never made it overseas. By the time industry was pulled up and running and the stuff was shipping, the war ended. Uh, you have to, one thing I, I like to have everybody bear in mind is the, the Allied powers were planning on a major offensive in the spring of 1919. They, so they were tooling up, and the, the idea was to have all of this equipment in France by the spring of 1919 for a major offensive against the Germans. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I guess you could say for the, the people on the front line, the, the German uh, economy and the German populace basically collapsed in October of 1918, and you have the October Revolution, which that where the people, the, the German people just said, you know what, that's it, we've had enough, and we're over, it. this war has got to end. And in November, you see the peace, the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles sign. So, what did we make? So, we, I mean, it, it just goes down. I mean, and, and, and this, and we're not talking like tanks, trucks, airplanes, you know, like the things that you're thinking of. We made all kinds of, um, you know, well, here's some of the things you're like, yellow birch, just raw, raw material, you know, spark plugs, very cleaning rods. Can you read those? Because I certainly sure yeah, can't see them. See them. Yeah, Chris. Oh, we can ask them. So, Albion uh, adapter, yeah, Adrian adapters, Albion leather goods, uh, Bay City, birch, crane, packing boxes, Benton Harbor textiles, Buchanan made steel wheels, Cadillac armor chests. Charlotte trench mortar fuses, Charlotte boy yellow birch, flint spark plugs, and cleaning rods and gladstone, leather goods and harness leather and Grand Haven. Uh, a lot of yellow, again, ironwood, ironwood. I think that is a princess, so that's yeah. uh, yellow birch again, iron mountain, so off of princess. So from, a lot of wood. Same thing we saw in the words, a lot of wood comes out of there from the peninsula. Aluminum, ammonium nitrate, uh, Jackson made a whole bunch of stuff. Carbon steel, <coughs> uh, hand grenade assemblies, rifle grenades, helmets, uh, Kalamazoo, trench mortar fuses, nickel steel, arm, lancing armor chest, artillery wheels. I mean, it just, it, it's a huge, it's a mammoth list. Uh, Marquette file handles. 
the thing that they kept track of. Uh, but once again, lots of yellow dwarf dynasty, uh, mining salts for Goodland. Uh, this is one of the rare instances where you talk, that you have an official document from the period that talks about the toxic gas program in, in Midland with Dow. Yeah. That the G34 project was, was very, very secret. And it, it's rare to see a, an official mention of it in this era. Uh, Monroe fiber disks, uh, board sheets, mosquito leather goods, salary, you know, miles, cotton, buck goods, fine egg breach, you know, grass, grass rods, fuses, gas shells, uh, bond release mechanisms, uh, Sim St. Marie, calcium carbide, center, uh, was the, the chemical plant there making ammonia nitrate. Whoa. <laughs> Tech St. Joe's was, it was at that time was still a textile center. And through her truck, you know, wind that caustic soda there. So Ypsilanti spoke shoes for artillery wheels. So I mean that, that kind of broke they broke it out. There were two two cities that were in that are spelled out specifically in the book uh, because of their production. One was Grand Rapids. Uh, Grand Rapids had a huge amount of production. Uh, the, the furniture, the, the furniture industry really kicked in, and they were making a lot of things, you know, bombs, carriages, packing boxes. There's a lot of talk about packing boxes in, in the yeah. book, which I think, it, and, and they talk a lot about shooks too, which I thought was, and I, I had no idea what that was, but a shook is a box that's that's not put together. Oh, so, <laughs> but apparently they were very important at that time. Sure. And then of course Detroit is <clears throat> Detroit gets its whole long little section. And I mean there's a ton of stuff. <clears throat> Mammoth number, guns, aim posts, ammunition bombs, <clears throat> artillery vehicles, caissons, bombs, you know, battery wheels, bayonet, you know, breaches, cartridge clips, cartridge cases, cleaning rods, copper and steel tube, cranes, cutters. Now, drawings, just just drawings about itself. <coughs> bead bags, bead bags, that's important. Gasoline tanks, hand hooks, helmets, high speed twist drills, and countersinks. <coughs> Can't make stuff out of those. Yeah. You know? And it's just, I mean, it goes on. You know, loading rammers, Liberty motors, lifting plugs, master gauges, motors, nitric acid. Oil droppers, oil tanks, packing boxes, paint, passenger cars, pneumatic tools, radiators, uh, the recuperators that we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, shells, which we'll also talk about a little bit later, shrapnel, shrapnel, shot bolts, uh, spanners and wrenches, sponge and rammers, steel balls for canister shell, tanks, tractors, tires, toolboxes. Toxic gas cylinders, you know, tool all, which was a key component of explosive transmissions, trucks and chassis, truck bodies. Do they make tanks as in combat vehicles or tanks yes. as in storage? Which which tank do they make here? We'll get to that in a second. Okay. We will cover the tanks in a moment. So more war workers. One of the things that is also mentioned in this particular document is the fact that the there, women war workers really stepped up and, and began to fill. Uh, the, the, uh, the American industri industry, uh, prior to the American entry into the World War I, was actually near capacity. Uh, it's one of those interesting things that, you, that people don't really talk about, uh, is that when a lot of the things that, we, that the United States used to get from Europe prior to the war, we began making. Uh, prior to 1914, uh, toys were, were a major export for Germany. And a lot of the toys that were sold were, were made in Germany. When, the United, when Germany gets blockaded, you know, the American companies step up and begin making the toys. <coughs> that's, that's just one example. So the Amer American industry not only was, were we picking up the slack for the things that were no longer coming from Europe, but we were also beginning to fill orders from 
from European entities. The, the British were coming over here to buy things, the French were coming over here to buy things. So production was ramping up, there was a, there was a labor shortage, they were filling it, wages were increasing, and so then, on, so one of the things to that is that when these people are going to work, they're getting more money, they then go out to buy stuff, which then drove the internal economy. So the World War I is one of those interesting cases where going to war actually kind of was counterproductive for, for the American uh, economy. The economy was booming when, with us not being in the war. We enter into the war and then we suddenly have this other problem. The draft comes up and you're drafting the men out of industry. So you have, you have a manpower or a labor shortage to begin with. You then start pulling the workers out of the, out of the workplace you know, to, to build up the military and then throw the, uh, throw the influenza pandemic on top of that, which was decimating you know, the population. And you have, you have the perfect storm where you're actually, it actually was harmful to, to industry and to the economy going into the, into the war. So you have this, you have an influx of women workers into the workplace, and like I mentioned earlier, you have this, in, this my, the first big migration of these poor, you may see a lot of these poor, primarily African American sharecroppers that are coming from the deep south coming up because they're hearing about these jobs where you can make three dollars a day. You can make three bucks a day. My God, let's load up the car, load up the horse, mule, let's go go to work. So, uh, so there's this. These pictures are from. Uh, it's actually a book that we have in the in the museum archive. It's called Company and Khaki. It is the, the history of the uh, American car and foundry, uh, what they did during the war. And these images are from the Detroit plant. And you can see the young ladies uh, working in the, actually doing machine. This is one of the first times you see women in, in, doing machining. Uh, uh, the automotive companies, Ford in particular, they use a lot of women prior to World War I in the textile and in the wiring harness. It's one of those things where, you know, where they thought well, women were apparently better at it than men were making the wiring harnesses. So you see a lot of women in the wiring harnesses, a lot of women in the, uh, in the uh, upholstery divisions. <coughs> but World War I, you start seeing women running, you know, I think that's what, a lady there? So, and she, here she's running the lake. You know, and Lincoln Motor Car Company was one of the first companies to open a welding school for women at this point in time. And down here you see the, the, these are the American car and pound caissons. And you can see the woman putting the finishing touches on them. Uh, there's a, here's a little quote. Here's a quote from the book itself. Uh, talk about Jackson, you know, the proportion some points of women workers was high 75%. So uh, I don't get nearly the credit they deserve, I think. The World War I we kind of overlook in general. Uh, this is technically not ordnance, because uh, this, is an air, this is the Fisher Body Aircraft Plant in Detroit, which would have fallen under the purview of the Signal Corps, not the Ordnance Corps. But I love this picture, and I want to put it in. And it's awesome. It's just a bit. I wonder how long they had to hold that phone. They're like, really? Can we go back to work now? <laughs> but I mean, I I love to, you know, no blue overalls and red polka dot bandanas here. So, now we're going to get into one of my favorite things. Uh, when the United States enters into the First World War, we're way, 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 way behind the curve when it comes to just weapons in general, but artillery in particular. Uh, so, we, had, we decided to adopt. Uh, French and British design weapons and go to war with them. French 75. Anybody tell me why the French 75 is important? Except for you, Kyle. Okay. okay. Well, the, French, the French 75 was one of the fastest breached field guns and had a rapid rate of fire because of the agility to be used. And then, uh, it also ends up becoming the main gun of the Sherman tank. Yes, it does. It's a great, great, and uh, 
My understanding, the last time it was used in combat was against the United States Army in Afghanistan in um, 2002. That was surprising. So the French 75, the uh, French Model 75 was designed in, uh, in uh, 1897. Uh, and it has this lovely thing on it called the recuperator. The recuperator is something that allows you to fire a gun on the French end rapidly and accurately. Uh, any of you, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen your, your Civil War movies, you know, where they fire the cannon and the cannonball goes that way and the cannon goes that way. And then, you know, and then they got to come back, they got to relay the gun. You know, the, front, the recuperator allowed you to fire the gun and the gun stayed where you put it. So it, it permitted things like indirect fire, not line of sight, you know, where you could actually have a gun behind the hill firing over the hill and somebody up on the hill with a telephone adjusting fire because it allowed you to make, to actually target your gun. Uh, in my opinion, World War One, the World War One stalemate is the result of this. Everybody will want to say, oh, the machine gun, the machine gun, the machine gun. Artillery, World War One was an artillery war. Those guys dug holes in the ground and went underground because of artillery. Yeah, artillery was key. Artillery was king in World War One. So, so there's the French 75. This is actually an American French 75 and uh, firing. Uh, once again, there's a case on which in the background it's a full recoil. could very well be a, a made here by American crime body. But you can see there, this, this gun is in full recoil, and these guys are sitting. You could never do that with a with like a Civil War cannon. Those guys couldn't be sitting on it because that gun would have took off with them. So here you see that that gun is fully recoiled, that round is going off, that gun is not moving. So is it like a shotgun gun? Yes, it's, it is very much like a shotgun gun. So, we did, one of the things we want to do is we want to make, we want to make this gun, we want to make lots of this gun. And, and it's and his bigger brother, the 155. So they come to these uh, two gentlemen, uh, you know, the Dodge brothers, who after reading about them, I would love to hang up a hung out of the bar with those guys. They had to be on the They were crazy. But they, uh, they, they come up and they're like, hey, Dodge brothers, you think you can make this? And they're like, yeah, what the hell, we can try. So the, one of the problems that we have, and we saw this with the with a lot of the stuff we brought from the French, from the French and the British, the Europeans didn't produce things; they they made them. So things were made lovingly, one at a time, hand fit, hand filed. You know, it took forever to make the stuff. So machine precision, right. and but it it was all hand fit. So you couldn't take one recuperator part. And another recuperator part makes all the parts together and build something. They were every, everything was it was it was art. It was, they were they were artists. They were not manufacturers. They were artists. So so the Dodge brothers were like you know what we can take this. And one of the big problems that we found with this stuff is that the Europeans were also terrible at making blueprints. And especially the stuff that we got from the French, it was in metric. What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> American, the American draftsmen are like, we don't understand. What is what what is a millimeter? Uh, so not only did we have to figure, not only did we have to figure out how to make this stuff, we had to actually figure out what it was made out of, what its dimensions were. They put a tremendous amount of work into the, into into these things, into reverse engineering them. And the government gave the Dodge Brothers eleven million bucks. <laughs> And they built the plant specifically for uh, for making the recuperators, and it was on Lynch. Yeah, it was on Lynch Road, and it becomes one of several uh, things that we see in the come up in the First World War called GoCos. Uh, take Commodore's here, a government-owned contractor operated, yep. where the plant itself is paid for by the government, but it's run by the contractor. This is a, a classic example of it. Uh, and by the end of the war, they're producing 17 recuperators a day, which is uh, uh, is that an eight-hour day or was it? 
No, I'm not sure what, what the, that they didn't specify. I have to look back at that. How many shifts were they running, uh, Chris? One or two? I believe they were running two. Okay, that'd be two. about, that'd be about a $16 day minimum. It could be. So, um, this, this particular plant, this particular plant, when the war is over, uh, they close it, they turn it back over to the government. The government decides, this is one of the plants the government decides to keep when the war ends. Uh, and they put it, uh, they, they turn it over to the government. Then the government realizes, oh, we really don't need it. So they end up taking all the equipment out of it and sending it to the Rock Island Arsenal. And then the plant is closed. And if, I, if my research, resources are correct, the land itself was turned back over to Dodge. So we have caissons, right, Fred Mustang? <laughs> no, that's the artillery song, okay? That's yeah, true, that's the artillery song. <laughs> so the caissons go rolling along. So what is a caisson? We saw the picture earlier. It, it was basically carried the ammunition yes. and implements. Yes. So oh, the caisson had some of them, but uh, so anything the gun didn't carry, yep. that it was on a caisson. Exactly. Okay, so, you, so you, uh, those these guns in that area have the gun, the limber, and the caisson. So a lot of the stuff that, was the, the, that made up a caisson was not particularly different from what made up a car. So a lot of the automotive industry here in the, in the state, like, yeah, we can make them. We have axles, there's a body, there's a couple of wheels on it. Here, we can do that. Why were caissons important at that time? Well. Like we said, quick firing artillery. And this, once again, this is this is uh, something you can use someday if you ever have this question on uh, Jeopardy. Uh, before before the recuperator, a typical gun battery would have you would have one caisson per gun plus a battery caisson. So your gun would be fed for about one and a half caissons. With the introduction of the recuperator, rapid fire artillery, you now needed four. So not only did you need a lot of caissons to haul out of ammunition, your train, your supply train got much longer. So one of the things that the French did is the French actually reduced the number of guns per corps. And uh, so you know, the Germans had 144 guns, the French had 92. But theoretically, the French had a better and more accurate rate of fire. Hey, Chris, this also tells you why feed bags are important. Yes, yes, because you had to feed all the horses, but all this stuff, this stuff was more strong, largely. So this brings us back to our friends here in Detroit, American Car and Foundry. American Car and Foundry was one of the largest ordnance plants uh, in the country. And one of the things I haven't been able to figure out is hired, so 10,300 hands, so is that like 5,000 people? <laughs> Uh, they specifically called out his hand, I assume that means people. So 10,300, they had 48 acres, uh, 17 acres under roof. So this, this is a substantial plant. So once they had it? orphan car companies for 500. And, uh, mm -hmm. That'd be about 5,150 people. Yeah. Where was the plant? That is a very good question. I don't know, I know exactly where that plant was. That I don't know. What, what was it was in the city of Detroit. Didn't they make um, uh, rail cars before the war? Yes. Well, American Car and Foundry was a huge company. They, they had plants all over the country. Uh, the Detroit plant did not make the rail cars. The rail cars were in one of their East Coast facilities. Uh, but American Car and Foundry goes on to make tanks in World War II. But their, their Detroit branch is gone by this point in time. Uh, but at one point in time, 8,000 vehicles were stored in the Detroit plant which made it one of the largest artillery parks in the nation. They had more artillery vehicles parked in the plant than they did in some of the art, uh, military bases. So this, this, this is the plant, the American Current Five, that's the yard. Uh, there's, there's our ladies again, working on the caissons. Now are those French Army production? These are American production. That's a French Army camouflage scheme. That's, yeah, that's what we're using though. We use theirs too. Yeah. I love that. I love that camouflage. Yeah. And one thing I love the, too is, is you notice the, the uniformity. This was not this this was not like a hodgepodge paint job. They were very fairly uniform. 
there was a specific uh, camouflage pattern adopted mm -hmm. yep. for that. And there were varying mm -hmm. patterns at that. Yep. Well, well, I just love the colors. Depending on the situation where it was going. And in there, yeah. this is actually, this is from America's Munitions, which is one of Benedict Crowell's books. He was, a, he was the director of ordnance at the DC level. And it's just incredible. I wonder where they all went. So we come by our buddy Henry. We all love Henry. Oh yeah. Henry was a little crazy. You know, Henry, Henry didn't want to be in the war. Henry didn't like the war. I mean, it, 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 you guys know about the peace ship? If you were back in the exhibit, you right there. You know, Henry decided when war broke out in France that he was or in, in Europe that he was going to charter a ship and he filled it full of his 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 pacifist friends and they sailed over to I believe it was Norway. And they were going to get all the Europeans together around a table, and they were going to settle this war. You're like, you guys need to come, and, you need, and we're going to make, we're going to put an end to this mess. Okay. It didn't, didn't work for a while. Henry well, was about as crazy as the Dodge brothers, and they were crazy. Yeah, the Dodge brothers seemed more seemed to be fun. Henry was just kind of a little odd. But, yeah, well, they were all. But when the United States enters into the war, uh, Ford through says, you know what, we're in the war, I'm an American, I'm, I'm patriotic, so I'm gonna do my part. Uh, a large part, of, and once again, it doesn't fall under the organs, but you know, the, the eagle bullets is a very important part of that. But we're gonna talk about the, specifically what, what Henry did for the ordinance, for or ordinance uh, He made gun caissons, and 4.7 inch, 155 millimeter caissons, he was made about 125 a day by peak peak of production. All right, come on. Yeah, and there's there's our 4.7 inch. Yeah. And then Ford also made the tank. <laughs> so it was the three ton. Ford made yeah. a three ton tank. Um, he was contracted to make 15,000 of these. They were two man tanks. They were powered by two Ford Model T engines. They only made 15 of them by the time the war ended. Uh, there's two left that I know of. Yeah, one's in, uh, pen, uh, one's yeah. in uh, Fort Benning, I think. Yeah, they're, they, they're restoring it right now. Yeah, there's a one that I think the one in Benning, they took the Ford engines out, put Jeep engines in it so, they could, so it was more reliable so they could play with it. <laughs> but they were going to. They were going to start making 100 a day. It had two engines, it mounted a machine gun, and it could be, and it was, of course, at this point in time, we're in the middle of the progressive era where efficiency is like the buzzword. Yes. So they make, they want, they make, if, if, if we talked about the Liberty engine, which, you know, modularity, uniformity, adaptability. So Ford makes this tank, which can be used as either a tractor or or a tank with a weapon, so that there's definitely a multi-purpose thing. Yeah. And there it is. It's kind of a cute little thing. If you, if you Google YouTube, search on YouTube, you can find a great video of driving around the Ford test track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember that because I saw that at the uh, Armor Museum at Port Knox yeah. many moons ago. So they, they only made 15 of these. They're fairly small, uh, but they never see combat and they never make it anywhere. But in the background here, you can see our, our next friend, which is the six-ton tank. So they the United States military adopted again a French design, French uh, Renault, the Renault French. six ton. And we're gonna have American companies make it. Uh, Ford is one of the companies that is pegged to, to make the tank. Uh, they manufacture it with uh, the Ford makes one. And the, what's interesting is that the Ford prototype was actually powered by a Hudson Super 6 because the idea again was mod, was a uniformity in production. Modularity. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and there. Yeah, that's a, uh, there, no. <laughs> that's a copy of the French uh, F key with no tank. Yeah, it could be modern, either a machine gun or a 37 millimeter okay. can. But it, Ford made one. And there's a, 
I guess the easiest way to tell the American one from the French one is that the exhaust is on the opposite side. I forget which was which. They also converted the inches. So the, the yeah. components with the French tanks could be used. Yeah. Yeah, they did. They changed yeah, them. They changed them awful lot. Of they redid them. Uh, Ford also was involved with the helmets, right? the Dean helmets in particular. So when the United States enters into the First World War, we adopt the British, uh, <clears throat> British tin lid. Uh, the British helmet was not intended to protect people. It was, it was intended to protect you from stuff raining down from above, which is why it has that, that shape. But we were toying around and we wanted to make our own helmet. So we, uh, we get the guy Bashford Dean, who goes to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and starts looking at the classic you know, armor and comes up with some ideas. There you go. So this is the uh, this is the standard helmet. This, of course, is the helmet we all know and love and recognize from the First World War. Uh, Sparks and Whittington of Jackson. Uh, stamped out 580,000 shells, and they were then sh sent to uh, the Ford plant in Philadelphia, where they were assembled and painted and then shipped out. But the shells themselves were made, were made here. So here's our first Dean helmet. It looks a lot like the helmet the Swiss adopt later. And the Russians. Too. And the Germans. Well, they, they were they were looking at the German helmet. They were looking at the German M nineteen sixteen, the coal helmet. Yeah. But they they came up with this, and uh, and it was a uh, Ford Motor Company produced uh, about two thousand of these. They were they were done used for testing. Uh, one of the problems that they had was the shape of it. The depth is that they had trouble doing the draw. And, and it, it's interesting because if you look at uh, cars of that time, if anybody remembers like your, your Model A's, even in the 20s, you have that cloth and wood insert in the middle of the roof. It's because of that, they still hadn't quite figured out how to do a compound curve in a, in a press without cracking things. So this is one of the things that they, they had real trouble making this helmet. And, and it, actually we have that World War II helmet in the museum. You saw it where the, where, where the the manganese tore when they were trying to press it. He, they still had problems with it in the forties, but that was one of that was one of the, the death blows to this particular helmet. And one of the things that I think is interesting is First World War. Uh, the French General Adrian is you know, they're one of the first ones to come up with the with the resurgence of the combat helmet. And one of the things General Adrian observed was that that soldiers would refuse to wear a helmet if they thought it was silly looking. <clears throat> so the helmet should look good, which is why you see the French avian, it's got the comb and the thing, you know, it's kind of fancy looking. And so they want the soldiers to be proud of it. And, and they, they, they experimented with a helmet similar to this in the 30s, and, and, and soldiers refused to wear it because they thought it looked dumb. <laughs> so that was the Liberty Bell. <clears throat> And this, the Liberty Bell helmet that came out of it, that the soldiers absolutely hated it. They refused to wear it because they're like, that just looks stupid. Mm -hmm. This is the one that they actually seriously considered. Uh, if you, any of you have seen the World War I German helmets, uh, they, the Germans were playing around with the, with the armor plate for the front and the face shields. Uh, the Germans had those two big Frankenstein lugs on the side of the helmet that were actually ventilators. And they had a, some armor that clipped onto that for you know for soldiers that were on forward sentry duty or at machine gun posts, so that if you were peering up over the parapet, you, you had a little extra armor. So this is kind of our answer to that. And uh, they made thirteen hundred of these. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you can tell that you, you can really see that you know that they went into the. The Museum of Art, and, and we're looking at uh, medieval armor. Yeah, they were. I just, I, I can't, I could, I can't see the your average American soldier wearing. I don't know. Yeah, I was sort of thinking that it'd be, it, it'd be a bear trying to, trying to see forward. 
But the, one of the things is that this helmet was not intended for like just general wear. This helmet was one of the things that they were specifically looking at was this helmet would have been for people standing sentry or, or manning fixed gun positions on, you know, machine gun positions in the trenches. Uh, which also runs somewhat counter to the American concept. The Americans are like, like get out of the damn trenches and advance. So, yeah, that was but, one of the first things they did when we entered the war. So, I mean, these kind of cool things. But these were, but these were made here in Detroit by Ford, and we were definitely in the middle of some experimental, you know, thought process. So I kind of move on again now to uh, this particular is what General Motors did. And the headings, the headings I'm using are actually chapter headings out of the book. So we kind of, they call it teamwork by motor plants, which is actually, they're referring to GM. Because at this point in time, GM is something entirely new. GM was a conglomeration of, of, of car companies that were operating under a common name. You know, General Motors at that time had Buick, Chevrolet, Cadillac, they already have Cadillac at that point? I think they just bought yeah. it. They just bought it. So you have this, so, so this is actually a fairly new concept in 1917 to have this, you know, a number of small car companies operating under a larger umbrella. So uh, you know, GM was contracted to, to, buy, to manufacture rounds for the three inch spokes, uh, the Morgan rounds, and you know, Buick, uh, Western Mott companies in Flint. Uh, Cadillac, North Bay Motor in Detroit, yeah. Jackson Church, Wilcox. So some of these things, you know, these branches have gone away too. You know, and Chevrolet, you know, and Toledo. Well, so Michigan is huge. Yeah, so they're making, you know, and there's, there's always there's this urban legend that floats around with, uh, in the automotive world that you know, Durant was a pacifist and refused to, to do. Uh, War work, and that the whole reason Lincoln Motor Car Company was because you know the Leland brothers were mad because they, because Durant wouldn't do Liberty engines. Uh, he was making stuff for the war. There's a lot of a lot of that was urban legend. I think it was just that the, the brothers wanted to start. They didn't want to work under him. But yeah, one of the problems that they encounter is that these these automotive manufacturers. They've never made ordnance before. They've never made shells. They've never made you know, bullets. And uh, one of the things they encountered was the material is a lot harder. And the automotive machinery wasn't rigid enough. And when they started machining them, they had concentration issues. You know, their, their equipment was made for making car parts. And they had, they just they were having trouble to adapting the existing equipment to make you know equipment to make the rounds. Uh, and they said that they encountered like the centrifugal grinders needed to be cleaned a lot more but just because of the materials they were using. Things clogged up. Uh, they had profile issues. There were totally different kinds of heat treat than they were used to. Uh, and a lot of the shells that they, that were made here by the car companies failed home inspection. It's just they weren't round enough, they weren't hard enough, they, were there. they had tremendous problems threading the nose cones, one of the things. And one of the things that told with the, that I found in the research is the, the copper driving bands just completely befuddled them. If any of you have seen an artillery round from that, you know, even today, you got that copper band at the bottom that seals it to the to the bore of the gun and you know conforms to the rifling. Well, that's installed afterwards, and they had a tremendous amount of trouble trying to figure out how to put those things on without actually crushing the shell. So, and then they had, they had a lot of, and like you said, we had a lot of manpower or, or, or uh, shortages. So, you had these inexperienced, a lot of it goes back to that too. You have inexperienced machinists, you know, people who don't really know what they're doing, and they're screwing stuff up. It's one of the things I found too is, you know, when we come out of World War I, you have this massive backlash against the merchants of death, as they like to call them. It goes into the, you know, in the 20s and the 30s, right up into the beginning of the, of the first, second World War. And people are just outright 
hostile against weapons producers, and a lot of them come back to like, well, these people that were profiteers, they made money off of the war. <coughs> and a lot of what comes back is a lot of the research that's done, if you really look at it, it wasn't just, it wasn't gross uh, greed. It was a lot of the cost overruns were just pure incompetence. So then they move on and we'll talk about the caterpillar tractors. So here we talk, uh, we mentioned the pea bags and the horses. But they also, you start to see uh, artillery and things being moved uh, by, by tractor and vehicle at this point in time. And so you have this relatively new concept again, the caterpillar tractor. And 25,000 caterpillars. And they, uh, Maxwell Motors here in Detroit made them. Maxwell Chalmers at the time, uh, Rio and Lansing, and Federal. There was a Maxwell Chalmers one that was in Ohio somewhere that was still running a couple years ago. We used to bring it up to that Finley show. It's kind of cool to see it. I don't know what happened to that thing. But uh, so there's a two and a half ton tractor, and there's a five ton tractor. Again, the one that crazy cattle flash pattern. That look a lot different than some of the ones you see today. Yeah. I mean, this this one here, not very much different from like the M5 high speed tractors you see in the second one. Yeah. Except it's a lot smaller. Oh. Anybody here know what a fellow is? I'm not sure. I this is also something that, that's kind of revolutionary in the, in the First World War. Uh, it comes out of Detroit. And it's sort of an accident because it's something that they had been playing with for the automotive industry and it just ends up being adapted for the war. The steel fellow, or the fellow, that's a fellow. Ah. So this is the fellow. And then the spokes go into the fellow. Uh, if you see a lot, of the, a lot of the previous pictures that we showed, like of the, of the French 75, it has a wood wheel with a steel band around it. Kelsey Hayes has been experimenting with the steel fellow, which allows us to come up with this new fangled thing called the pneumatic tire. Okay. Wow. So, and, and this, once again, this is one of those things, the Kelsey Hayes Wheel Corporation of Detroit, <clears throat> this is a, it's a, it's an accident that this happens to correspond <clears throat> with the war. Uh, they had been playing with this for a while and they finally perfected it and the military takes it and the military tests it. And they run, they put these pneumatic tires on things and they run the bejesus out of them and come to the conclusion these actually work. And they work a lot better than what this, this crazy stuff we have been using. So they get a special mention in the book again. And it's just one of those lucky coincidences. Uh, Kelsey Hayes, yeah, every, the wheel on every single one of the cars he drove here can probably trace itself back to Kelsey Hayes. Because Kelsey Hayes comes, first they come up with the steel fellow, and then they're, and then they're like, well, now we can get rid of those wood spokes, we can go with steel spokes. And then Kelsey Hayes comes up with the steel disc wheel uh, shortly after that. So they were definitely a key player. And they made a ton of wheels for the war effort. So some of the other stuff that comes out of the Detroit Ordnance District. Uh, Central Michigan Atlas Powder uh, produces natural <coughs> explosive. Uh, once again, they never really reached full production because the war ends. You know, Morgan and Wright designates 36,000 square feet uh, of, their, of their tire plant in Detroit for making gas masks. And once again, 80%. Uh, um, you see a large woman from the workforce. And then we had a ton of them, you know, we had some chemical plants here, especially up in Midland. Uh, they, they were sinking the, even, even prior to our entry into the war, they were sinking the wells over there along the, along the, the coast, you know, Lake Huron, for the, bringing up the brine to make, the, make this lovely stuff. And then there's our buddy, there's our, the Shooks. It took me forever to figure out what that was. So 233,000 box shooks. So apparently there was a tremendous demand for boxes that were just shipped somewhere flat. 
It makes sense because that way they could, they could. Uh, it was easy to ship, yeah. but at the other end, they could assemble, put them to use. Yeah, so, Done. So we need a lot. We need a lot of this stuff. Yeah. So I mean, there's definitely a tremendous amount that went on here. <clears throat> so like I said, you know, like it's been saying the whole time, the United States was in the war 18 months. Uh, we never, the American industry never fully transitioned to war production. We were, we never stopped making consumer goods. And so we were always running both. And we still managed to produce a mammoth amount of stuff. Uh, most, like I said, most of it never went overseas. It ended up staying here and, well, we got scrapped. So, but it was an incredible te teaching tool. I mean, you think about what, what we then did yeah. 25 years later for the Second World War. You know, a lot of these same players are involved in Bernie Baruch and, and Ford. Uh, probably more so Edsel in the Second World War than, than Henry, but I think Henry certainly had already begun losing it by then. And uh, but he's, it was it was definitely a, a learning tool, a yardstick, and and uh, it worked tremendously for us. So, any questions? I guess. Point out. I gotta say one thing, Chris. Well done. <laughs> I question for you, Chris. Yeah. The, uh, so, Roberts in charge of the Detroit district, he said, was he ever in the military? Did he maintain the civilian? As far as I know, he, they were civilian chiefs. <clears throat> it, it was not, it, it looked like in World War II, they started giving them honorary division. Right. And there was nothing that ever indicated they were, <clears throat> that they were happy in World War II. They were, they were almost all important businessmen. <clears throat> How were they selected? They appointed them? They, they were appointed by by DC, so I, you know there, there was a lot of that, you know, like, the rich white boy club. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. They are, everybody knew each other at that point. You know? So were they a dollar day man like in World War Two? I do not believe like they year. were. There were dollar a year men in World War One, mm -hmm. uh, but I believe the division chiefs were salary. That's another one of those things where it doesn't really talk about all that much. They don't really mention those things. Yeah, it it begs it it, it, it kind of begs you because you don't know if they're act they were at you know, what levels whether they were fully uh, uh, full members of the civil serv uh, federal civil service or not. Yeah. Uh, good many of these guys were just basically serving at the pleasure of. Yeah, and and you, see a, volunteer. you see a lot of that, and, you know, the, the economic, the, was, I guess the economic mobilization of this, of the country for both world wars, you see a lot of the, we have these wealthy industrialists who, and especially for World War One, who, who somehow felt this patriotic call, you know, you don't, you don't see the greed really kick in yet, you know. Go well, like a couple weeks ago, the professor gave a talk on the uh, little run. He said that at the end of World War One, all those they were really starting to crank up production and all that. When the war was over, the contract was just ended, and yes. you were sitting on all this caissons and product that were completed that the military that the government wouldn't take. You had partially made uh, portions that they wouldn't take, and you had all kinds of parts and stuff that they wouldn't take. So. They said, he, like he had mentioned that they didn't do that in World War II, at the end of World War II, because after World War I, he said that, that all that uh, uh, material that you had was all taxed. Yes. So they, they had to get rid of it all. And in World War II came along, they, they decided at the end of World War II not to do that. Like he shows on the, that last plane that came out of the World War and bomber plant was flown to uh, Romulus and then flown to another base and sat for 15 months or something, then they scratched it because they just that. Yeah, World, World War One. The term, and, and I mean that's we could, we could discuss that for like a whole other hour. But the, the war ends. You have all of these outstanding contracts, and the government. We had never had this. We didn't. We didn't know what to do, and they just 
they just end them. And you have companies that have built facilities specifically. I mean, uh, one of the one, and one of the companies that is always kind of keyed in on uh, it's not it's, it's not the Trade Organs District, but is uh, I just went blank. The, the other chemical company, uh, Dow. not Dow, uh, Dupont. Dupont, you know, smokeless powder, which was the military standard. Is extreme at this point. At that point in history, is is highly corrosive, and it it requires. It, so they build Dupont builds an entire facility specifically to build military grade smokeless powder, originally for the British and the French before the American entry into the war. And they, they don't know is the war going to last ten minutes or is it going to last ten years. So Dupont puts a surcharge on per pound on the powder that they make because they're like, okay, we're going to have to try and recover the cost of building this brand new plant somehow. So they put the surcharge per pound on the powder and they never take it off. So they're going, they're going throughout the entire war with, you know, I forget what it was, like a couple of dollars per pound, you know, and then the war ends on going for four years. So they make a mammoth amount of money off of this. And they're trying to figure out, and the government's company, they were actually one of the poster child, you know, the government went after DuPont specifically during the war, 1917, and tried, and tried to, and they made the tax retroactive, and they, it, it almost, it, so what DuPont then does is to try and shield themselves from this, this crazy tax, is they, they up the salaries of all of their, of all their, uh, Administrators, you know, the, the company the executives, executives. Yeah. because and they're like, oh, see, well, see, now it's paid, so it's it, it's a loss, and it's not because the, the executives were greedy; it's because the company's trying to figure out how to not end up going bankrupt from this crazy tax. So it makes them look even worse. Yeah, you know, and, and there's a ton, there's a ton of stuff like that that goes on. Well, and like he said, when World War II started, and they had to start this all over again. He said a lot of American industry was yeah. very hesitant to get into the to help out because they didn't want to get started. Tremendous on. amount of American companies that just were like, no, we don't want to deal with the government because they all remember what happened at the end of World War One. Right? <clears throat> at the end of World War One, it was just brutal, and they were ca they were canceling contracts and pennies on the dollar. It, it was it was a mess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you were going to mention the cost of the booklets. Oh, the, the books are fifteen dollars. Yes. Yeah. Sure charge on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all cash. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes. If you've ever seen the World War One exhibit, it's in the back room. Please, uh, please uh, check it out.